When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that we wouldn't disturb the neighbors. And we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late, and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around this time, so I lay awake for hours, just thinking. Around 3 a.m., I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation as someone walked on it outside of our tent. I was stunned with terror. For one, because this was a private field owned by a farmer, who would probably be angry to find us there, but more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent where there wasn't before, no approaching steps, nothing. I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to a dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly, listening to this person and his dog walking back and forth outside the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow, which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us every time he passed our tent and I couldn't see the dog's shadow, even though I heard it making increasingly erratic circulations of the tent. This carried on for around five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking just outside the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing. When I was sure that the sounds had ceased and that there was no threat waiting for me outside, I freaked out at my friends, still as quietly as possible, and said that we had to go because someone knew we were here and we could get in trouble with the owner. I told them everything that had happened, but they didn't believe me, thinking that I had been asleep as well and had dropped the whole thing. I assured them that I hadn't and that we had to go right away. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me because they're lazy as hell and didn't want to pack everything up and go. I gave up too, even though I knew that now I'd never get to sleep. 10 minutes later, the sounds returned in the same way they had gone. The volume gradually increased just outside the tent. It wasn't like anybody approached. It was just louder and louder, and then it was there. I felt the same dread that I had felt before and whispered one of my friend's names so they could wake up and hear. One person said, shh. They had already heard it and they told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It felt like it took five minutes for me just to reach it so I was sure not to make a single sound, and I pulled it down so violently I nearly ripped the whole thing in half. There was nobody there. We got out within the space of about five seconds, and there was nobody anywhere. As I said, we were atop a hill in the middle of a field, so we could see if anyone had decided to run, but there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anybody to escape our seeing them, I am absolutely positive that there were footsteps outside our tent that night. This is just added to by the fact that my other friends heard it the second time. To this day, we have no idea what it was. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. 
I was about eight or nine years old, and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too. And when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boar and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there, you would have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road and then drive about an hour up the mountain off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room, no doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. 
I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there, mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just a part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling really vulnerable. At some point during the trip, my cousin, sister, and I started wandering around outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing the small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but just small hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flows and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and tell that it was a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say be careful what you wish for, because in one lava tube in particular, we found something. We smashed it, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones sitting on long brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but like some kind of animal, maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary at all. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to them. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there there was no physical way that a person could have put those there. And why wouldn't they have gotten destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years at least because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it almost. The only explanation we could think of was that it had been an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asks us if anybody went to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, that's weird, he says. I woke up and saw somebody standing at the sliding door, so I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other horrified, like, what if it was the person that left the offering and we totally disturbed it and now we're screwed? We asked for more details. He said that it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man and that he just stood there at the door staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and they were mad at me. It could have been a human, sure, but it seemed really unlikely given our location. There were no other cabins or homes built at the hunting grounds, nowhere near them. Either way, I never stayed there again. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared 
to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot, seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there, and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel and we turn on our flashlights. Literally none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. 
We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now, remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car. This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day, and I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there what they did and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot, seemingly a girl's, 
with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there and now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. 
Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, hooey makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day, and I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant-infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. We were on our trip to Yellowstone from California. We were a group of seven adults. We took a flight to fly to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we drove up to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had booked a cabin. We reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. on the first day. This was a huge cabin with a living room, kitchen, one master bedroom, and a dining room downstairs, with a set of stairs on either side to go upstairs. Also, there was an entrance into the kitchen as well as the landing outside the master bedroom from outside, apart from the main entrance that ended up in the living room. There were about four bedrooms and three bathrooms upstairs, a very old and rustic looking cabin. We didn't feel anything bad during that entire evening. However, the nighttime did feel very eerie. My husband and I slept in one of the bedrooms. One of the couples used the master bedroom downstairs and another took the master bedroom upstairs that was farther down the hallway from our room. The only single guy in the group took the bedroom next to us. So on our first night there, we all went to our respective rooms at about 11 p.m since we had plans to leave early for Yellowstone the next day. My husband and I both fell asleep as soon as we hit the bed. I don't know what time it was, but I suddenly woke up with a scream. At the same time, my husband woke up with a scream too. While I do have nightmares and have in the past where I would cry in my sleep, it was the first time that I had ever screamed, and I don't remember having any dreams or nightmares that night. My husband has never had nightmares, so it was unusual for him to wake up that night too. The guy in the next room was on the phone talking to somebody. He heard our screams and came in to check on us. We assured him we were okay. Again, we all went to bed, but I kept having weird feelings throughout the night, and I was completely unable to sleep until I saw the sunlight coming through the window. We all woke up at around 9 a.m., and we were discussing the incident. The other two couples were unaware of it, but they did mention hearing random footsteps throughout the night, thinking that we were up walking around. We were there for five days, and we didn't experience any other events for the rest of the stay. But the cabin gave out significant negative energy, and not a single one of us wants to stay there again. We would leave as early in the morning as we could, and come back late at night, just to sleep. We haven't had any other experiences like that ever again. It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, 
and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night. This creepy encounter occurred in the fall of 2001. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails, every which way, that snaked around and down the haulers and to the roads. My friends and I, 11 to 12 years old at the time, had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay and we rode around on the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off on the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed by a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket, blocking the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the thing. So we started heading back on the main road, and again, about halfway back, we passed the small pickup truck with the men. My friend and I joke that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog that they dropped off and that they hadn't buried it the way they should have. We get almost back to my house and decide we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe on the other side of the gate. So off we go. We turn onto the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around, but the dog is kind of laying on half of the blanket. So we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket, we could move the blanket and the dog out of the way without actually touching or disturbing it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes, it's clear that she is not touching the blanket so we turn around to head back home. We start back down the gravel road and after a second, we turn to the straight part. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup is sitting in the road, blocking our only exit. The trees touch both sides of the truck, so there's no going around it. Two large men sit staring at us. After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate into safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I hadn't given up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. That gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it and it really didn't change much. I like to think that our town is really safe and that the men were just curious about what the heck we were doing going back and forth. 
But when I read some stories, I think about what it could have been, how it could have gone differently, and it really freaks me out. I was a child of divorce and, as such, was often taken by my dad on weekends when I was a kid. He spent most of that time waxing his car at my grandparents who lived out in nowhere North Carolina since he lived in a condo with no hoses to wash his precious. Ignored, my brother and I were typically left to our own devices and wandered the fields and woods around my granddad's land, which was about a half hour drive from civilization. My family owned the neighboring homes and great swatches of land between and behind the homes, so we could pretty much explore out there for hours. All this said, there were some really disturbing things that happened there, and I personally think they're either too absurd or too subtle to have been my childhood imagination. You can decide for yourselves though, and I'd love to hear what you guys think might have been going on. Here are some things I remember. My great uncle was the kind of a jack of all trades. He bought and sold used cars. He also bought wrecks to strip and scrap, dumping the useless husks in a field and the woods up a trail behind his house. My brother and I called this place the car graveyard. On its own, it was eerie, with cars all the way back from the 50s in various states of disrepair. I used to climb inside them until I got into one that was tacky with what might have been dried blood. Sometimes I'd find bones out there, deer mostly, but they'd be in odd places, like skulls on car hoods. My guess is that it was just poachers on his land messing around because he didn't hunt, but who knows. I never saw any with skin or fur. One day, my brother and I were going to the car graveyard, but up the trail to it, we started to hear what sounded like pained moaning up ahead, where the derelicts were. We turned tail that day. Oddest, perhaps, from the car graveyard was the one time we actually went really far back to see just how deep the cars went. It continued into the woods for a while, with trees sometimes growing right out of the wrecks. My brother and I saw something ahead that looked like fog or mist, which reminds me of another story, but that's for another day. We didn't think much about it because we were kids, but this was mid-afternoon and the mist was only in one area. We passed on through and felt inexplicably weird and decided to give up on seeing just how far back it went. When we got back to my granddad's place, things seemed off. It was really hard to explain. My dad looked like my dad and acted like him, but he didn't feel the same. My brother felt this same dissonance too, and we got this wild idea that when we crossed the fog, we somehow stepped into another dimension, maybe just slightly different from our own. Maybe it was just stupid kid stuff, but I still remember how oppressive this feeling of not belonging was. We booked it back across the fog again, and when we came back, everything immediately felt as right as rain. We went back as an adult to that same spot, no fog, but there was a particularly off-putting sensation. A few other odd things happened out there, but not in the car graveyard. We heard laughter coming from a hole in the woods. I swore that I saw the stereotypical sheet ghost near the woods, but as soon as I looked, they vanished. I regularly saw a face in the shadows between the trees across the field. It reminded me of Morlock from the 60s time machine. I saw a log truck carrying a bear on its back that was as tall as a house. It was probably some fiberglass thing for a store or putt-putt golf, but it was still a really odd thing to see. I hesitate to add this one because it's just so goofy, but what the heck. One day my brother and I were messing with my granddad's walkie-talkies and we saw this really odd looking bird in the sky. We joked that it looked like a flying monkey from the Wizard of Oz and said, flying monkey, flying monkey, come in flying monkey, into the walkie talkies. Another voice came through and said, someone get me a flying banana. A bit spooked, we went into the kitchen and took a banana to leave it outside, and we stayed indoors for the rest of that visit. When we left, only the peel was sitting outside. That's about all I got for that area. 
A few things happened inside the house too, but that's not really pertinent to this story. So I used to live near an infamous road. It's a thin road with no street lines, has only a few houses at the end, and is lined with thick woods. There were no street lights. We heard stories like ghosts being spotted in the woods, weird beasts, creepy vibes, and a penny thrown off a small bridge coming back to you. Things like that. Urban legends, really. My boyfriend and I decided to drive down it one night in his car. It was a small stick shift car. The road had several pull-offs where you could park and sit. We pulled off at the first one and took some footage of the woods. Nothing happened. So we continued driving to the next pull-off. We parked and shut off the car. We heard some rustling, but we both assumed that it's an animal moving away from the sound of the car parking. We sat there for a few seconds in the dark of the woods. We heard something hit the car like a rock or something. Then we heard several pounds on the truck and the roof. At this point, we decided to drive off. He attempted to start the car to no avail. He tried this several times before it eventually did start. He then put it in gear and stepped on the gas, but the car stood still. I was freaking out and told him to stop messing around. He said he wasn't. Then the car, while in first gear and the gas was depressed, began to be pulled backwards. Against all logic, the car was fighting to go forward against something that wasn't visible. The taillights lit up the forest behind us and there was absolutely nothing there. Out of nowhere, the car miraculously just jumps forward and we drove away from the pull-off. Blown away by this experience, we decided to find another pull-off. This was stupid. The one we found was before the bridge where pennies are thrown. We go over to the bridge and throw a penny. We hear it hit the small stream. We look back at the car and we swear that we see somebody walk behind it. So we rush back to the car, but there's no sign of anyone. This was the last straw, so we decided to get off that road ASAP. We get in the car and we speed off. As we're driving, something small hits and chips our windshield. It did not sound like a rock. It sounded like a penny. Whatever was on that road wanted us gone and we haven't gone back since. Last year, I was backpacking deep in the mountains in Montana. I was near Libby, Montana, about three hours west of Glacier National Park. I was hiking alone, and I expected to encounter bears, moose, etc. I'm experienced, and I know how to handle them, so I wasn't scared. But this time, I was way out in the middle of nowhere, with nobody around for miles. Also, no cell service anywhere, and I didn't have my emergency beacon with me. Usually, I expect to see other hikers on the trail, but not here. Nope. I was out there completely alone, and I knew it. Well, it was like nine miles to my camp up at Cedar Lake. About halfway, the trail opened up, and I was in a somewhat clear area and had better visibility of what was around me. There were still trees and green undergrowth covering the ground. A few minutes later, I see something quickly scurry across the trail, maybe 50 feet in front of me. I stopped, froze, and waited. The creature noticed me and then stood up in the undergrowth, but still almost completely covered by the tall grass and shrubs. It was about three feet tall, pitch black, 50 to 60 pounds, and obviously very quick and intelligent. I assumed it was a baby black bear at first, so I didn't move or make a sound, and I got my bear spray ready, fully expecting an angry mama bear to come roaring out of the trees at me. But thankfully, that didn't happen, because I surely would have been attacked or at least bluff charged. All I could see was its face through the tall grass. The creature stared at me invasively for about 30 seconds. I was staring back at it. I didn't move a muscle. Then, suddenly, it huffed loudly at me and then ran through the grass up the side of the hill and I never saw it again. 
The sound it made was a lot deeper than you would expect from something that small. It was like a bear's growl. You could almost feel it inside your chest. Very unsettling. I stood there silently and waited for another few minutes to see if Mama Bear was nearby and that it was indeed a cub, but nothing came. I gingerly passed through that area on the trail and kept hiking. My research tells me it may have been an otter or a mink, but I've seen them before, and this wasn't like anything I've seen before. It was the way it moved. I only saw it for a second, but it almost slithered on the ground like a reptile and then stood up on its hind legs and watched me, making me feel really uncomfortable. There was something sinister about it. I checked for tracks, but couldn't find any. I have no idea what that thing was. Before I get into my story, I'd like to give a little background about my dog growing up. His name was Fonzie because he had long black hair with a white patch on his chest. Growing up, he was my best friend and protector. He was a mix of Chow and German Shepherd. And if you've ever met a Chow, I'm sure you're well aware that once they imprint on you, they won't accept anyone but you. And they are fearless protectors, which was just multiplied with the mix of German Shepherd. When I was eight, we lived in the foothills of Mount Baker in the Pacific Northwest. It was a not so populated area. One evening around dusk outside my house, Fonzie and I were up to our usual shenanigans. He would sit behind me as I shot my BB gun at some targets I had set up on the tree line. All of a sudden, he moved in front of me and started growling, which only happened when he felt that I was in danger. Right after he got between the tree line and me, about 20 feet, a very deep and loud, almost clicking sound came from the trees. Limbs were breaking and you could hear the ground pounding. We were both terrified. He started whimpering, which he never did. We both ran into the house. I looked out the window to see if whatever it was had come out of the woods, but nothing emerged. I told my dad about it, but he didn't believe me. He jokingly said, oh yeah, it was probably Bigfoot. But I've never heard of any Bigfoot story where it charged someone. Black bears tend to stay away from loud dogs, and it was way too loud to be a cougar. So that's my story. It was by far the most terrifying experience of my life, and it still haunts me to this day as a 31-year-old man. I live in a tiny town in northern BC. We are surrounded by a lot of untouched forests and beautiful rivers. My family lives out in the country and we're about 10 minutes away from an uninhabited valley. It had an old road going through it from ages ago and it had an old pioneer homestead that we could make our way down to. I think some loser kids burnt it down around 2000 or 2001 though. Even from a young age, I hated going to this place with my family. I had no reason to despise it so much. Everyone that visited was always in awe of how beautiful it was down there. But I always just got this sick feeling in my stomach. My sighting was from when I was very young, so I realize not many will believe it, but it stuck with me. My family was showing a cousin from Australia this place. Our town is boring, so outdoor stuff is really all we have to offer and I was sitting on my dad's shoulders while the adults walked around. Now the road we were on had large shrubs on either side. In BC, we have a berry called Saskatoons, and the bushes on this stretch were tall and thick. Because I was on my dad's shoulders, I could see over these, but nobody else could. I remember looking over, and on the other side of these bushes was this big field with a dense forest on the other side. I saw something massive and stark white walking on two legs into those trees. As a dumb kid, I yelled out, polar bear, which my parents obviously ignored because there are absolutely no polar bears here. And that was that. I still have no idea what I saw, but I'm sure there could be a rational explanation involving an albino animal, possibly an overactive kid's imagination. 
My neighbor, who is also the closest thing that I've had to a grandfather, lives in a spot that overlooks a large field with a valley below. You pass his home to get onto the property that I had my sighting on. A few years ago, he told us of a night that he watched what he thought was a helicopter coming in to land in the large field below his home. Right as he looked at it, it was landing, and then it shot straight up and disappeared into the sky. He's a pretty serious guy, and he said this in front of my parents, so I doubt he would lie. He's convinced that he witnessed a UFO. At that point, I thought, all right, maybe there was something to what I saw. And then, my younger sister had a sighting. She was driving home on our country road after a late shift. She remembered seeing two dark silhouettes of people, no reflective clothing or anything, walking in the pitch black and thinking, wow, what idiots. Just then, one of these things turns and glances at her. She told me that it had green eye shine, which she knew that humans shouldn't have yet it was human-shaped. She glanced quickly down at her clock and then back up, and whatever she had seen had completely disappeared in front of her. I'm still not sure what I saw that day, but given that my neighbor and my sister have seen things that are strange in the same general area, I'm thinking maybe I wasn't such an imaginative kid after all. I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this post is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this post is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can, soon. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky county comprised of old coal mining towns that at one time had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible, natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county, in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. We are always looking for somewhere neat to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask some of his work buddies if they knew of any rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we'll call the Old Lake, and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken wildlife management area, about 10 miles outside of town toward the state line, at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains past the wildlife management area boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance, nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs, but he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him, as he put it. He quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me 
that I had been told something similar years ago. This story, too, implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs, as well as, quote, something like what a preacher puts his Bible on. A pulpit, I think, is what he meant. Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge with their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to have me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their predominantly Scots-Irish ancestors who emigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the backside of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dockside where families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had long abandoned this wildlife management area. We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the wildlife management area, about a half mile in, we decided it was wise to go no farther. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that wraps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends to set out to the old lake. Two of us came with firearms and the other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with large jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous jagged pieces seemed to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge, above which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed, now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of a steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small, scattered stones laid upon by long-fallen trees, all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash of the trailhead, this high-up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we wound through thick growth made of a tree I'd never seen. Low-hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk, appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Beside that, there were quite a few other types of foliage that I had also never seen before. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the whole path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, this wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. We assessed that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. 
Google Maps showed that we were near a rock crawling and ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the other side. The place was old for sure. Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon tunnel and descend before dark, but we didn't make it there in time before having to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness. Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit would certainly breed desolation of the soul. Yesterday, I rang up a lady we'll call Marla, whom I've known for quite a long time. Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake. I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I didn't expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, through their family cemetery, and up a long dirt path. One day, Marla received a call from her father, asking her to tell her father-in-law, who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son into the mountains that day. He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned, because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain, but that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shook his head and declined to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police had run off the loitering creeps. She claimed to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site and a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she has no photo evidence. The next weird experience to befall Marla didn't come for almost six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else she's told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, then age seven, on a walk to the old lake to check out the creek, catch salamanders and find rocks as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up toward the initial incline and past the Mark Wildlife Management Area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices farther into the woods. As she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered toward Mason's crown. A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent like that of a typical Southern preacher. 
The voice spoke rapidly and was periodically answered by a group of voices which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from high atop the ridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead, fearing that whomever had gathered there had seen her and was warding her off. Like the others, she's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him, and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed in an amount of time they described as unusually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years after the incident her father described, two fish and wildlife officials showed up at her house in the middle of basically nowhere, the men admitted that they had no clue where they were. They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise very familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marla noted that both were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept almost 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences and those of her family, but has found few. The only presumption she's gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad, benign covens of witches yet existent within unbroken bloodlines, wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through the infliction of suffering, old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with the coal country's prosperous towns dotted across all of rural Appalachia. There is much to be uncovered and there's even more that should be altogether left alone. If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature an isolated mountain range with an ancient soul, wherein you can find whatever old secrets you might be looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There's much more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties as well. I fully intend on going back to follow the stream of Lonesome Creek itself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time we will find the path to get there. Marla and I are supposed to meet in person so that I can write some of her stories down for good detail. I look forward to that. And I will continue to share with you whatever I'm able. So a little background to set the mood, and this is all 100% true. I grew up in central New York, between Parrish and Mexico, you can look up Happy Valley and see just how creepy it is. Surrounded by woods, farms, fields, gravel pits, and swamps. I'm outside roughly 90% of my day. I do firewood, logging, farming, hunting, fishing, and trapping. I'm certainly used to the creepy shit in the woods. So much so that there's a predator light on my walking stick which is a backwards facing LED light. People deter tigers from leapfrogging on them by wearing masks on the back of their heads, but we only have fishers, coyotes, and the occasional wandering bear. 
So every night on the wood line, I have a pimp fire pit set up that I use pretty much every single night. It's not uncommon to see raccoons and foxes. We feed the birds and even have a huge turkey and deer feeder. My house is basically a safe haven. We constantly have critters running amok in the daytime and especially at night in the shadows. So you get used to the random ground leaf flutter, twig snapping, chittering critters in the forest nooks and crannies staring at you, wondering if you're going to eat that last hot dog. It can be unnerving, honestly. But then there's my clicky buddy who always says goodnight to me. It began when I moved into a good buddy's house. He and I are very much alike. Hard-working outdoorsmen who hunt, trap, and collect firewood. I've recently gone through some changes in my life and I was lucky enough to move in with him, which is only four miles away from where I grew up. Every night after working or running through a trap line, I'd work on my fire pit, which is in a clearing we made to store firewood right on the edge of the forest. I'd hear this clicking, like a slower version of the predator's clicks. The sound was kind of random at first, but then I noticed it reacting to me moving, grabbing a beer, click, click, packing a pipe, click, building up the fire or taking a leak, click, click. At first it freaked me out, like to the point of carrying a bigger knife than I should. Some nights a loaded 223. A couple of those wandering bears came within a quarter mile of my fire pit, so. I wear a headlamp, I have a lit lantern by me, a roaring fire, a machete, the walking stick, so I'm pretty comfy, even though I'm kind of crapping my pants as I yell at the darkness to come and get me. So when the fire dies down, no more smoke for the pipe or hot dogs for my belly, I'll start packing up my stuff and get ready to head inside. Click, click. I look around for eye shine, nothing. I move closer to the woods, stray a little to reposition my headlamp casting shadows. Click. I've even clicked back and it kind of responded to me a few times, but I could just be stoned out of my gourd. I mean, it's freaked me out so much a few times. I've literally built up the fire just to walk away. My fire pit is built for that kind of thing. I'm literally a pro at having fires. When I did, click, click. Now, we do have nocturnal flying squirrels here, and one trick the squirrels, all squirrels, do is that they'll hide on the opposite sides of trees as you pass by. You'll never see or hear them. You won't know that they're there. Unless a friend is walking 20 feet in the same direction and you're both looking up at the trees, the squirrels can't hide from both of you. But I don't think this is what I'm hearing. It would make sense since I can't see whatever's making the noise, but they tend to chitter more than click click. So now it's been over a year or so of hearing this sound and I'm nowhere closer to finding out what it is. I've come to accept it. I'll even leave some food at the edge of the wood line, beginning of a trail for it, which is usually where I relieve myself and then go back to the fire or inside. So almost every night, I'll hear the clicks and I'll say goodnight back or call its mom a dirty name. I mean, I don't speak click, who knows what I'm saying, but I click back anyway, and then I head inside. I suppose this isn't a scary story, it's just creepy, and I wanted to share it. I know it might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed, except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog. 
but still. It was a super sunny day, and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And if you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird, since I've read all the info of the reserve, and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access, and I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance, and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. There are no cars except for mine, and not a soul out there. The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods, even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing. Like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out. So I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home, trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off. So I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve, or at the office. It was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then, I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer. 
or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12 gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything, but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour. It was now 5.30 in the morning and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved for a second until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes when I'm in the living room watching a movie or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. I 
I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then, I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12-gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything, but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic, and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open, and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there, but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour, 
It was now 5.30 in the morning, and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved, for a second, until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact, and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes, when I'm in the living room watching a movie or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night, and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident, and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days, actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. Where I live, we have had relatively few big cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no street lights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then, it would gradually grow fainter, then stop, as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance. Then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, 
as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed and thankfully he did. I sat vigil listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. So this happened relatively recently. My friends and I were living at a cabin in Lake Tahoe in California. It was in May, so not snowing, but the nights got down to near freezing temperatures. We had gotten some firewood burning in the fireplace and the three of us were chilling around it. We were drinking scotch and had turned down all the lights all the way down in the cabin. The nearby houses were about 300 yards out and they had their lights down as well. We heard creaking on our roof for two to three seconds, which stopped. That was followed by what sounded like a bag or something mildly heavy dropping on the roof. Then it was followed by the scariest, heaviest rumble any of us had ever heard. The entire roof shook, but nothing else in the house did. So we knew it wasn't an earthquake. We almost felt like something broke the roof and was coming down the stairs to get us. We screamed and picked up the hot fire pokers and searched through the cabin, tapping walls and the attic area. We looked up the chimney for raccoons as they tend to hide there. Also, this wasn't the first night we had had the fire. If a raccoon mama was nesting, she would have fell through the chimney. We found nothing. We saw our neighboring house turn on their lights and they came out with searchlights. They had heard a similar sound. 
We all thought a bear had run from our roof to theirs, but it's unusual for a bear to do that. The neighbor's dog was quiet through it all. I checked that there was no way out from the chimney besides up, so if something was in there, it couldn't have escaped the roof without popping the lid, which was intact. We don't know what it was. For the next two nights, we had a fire up. Nothing. Not sure what it was, and perhaps I'll never know. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow. And feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hear something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent. 
almost as if it was walking in a big repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless, I didn't hear it make a sound. The beachhead was gravel, and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere, but I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood, frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. I was five foot eight and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders, had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head and the face looked like a person but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible. The hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking. Its eyes were black and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there looking at each other. I was stunned and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello, in a broken half whisper. I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, 
had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again, and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas, all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud, but in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of Eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear, maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building, to this day, that still mystifies me. This event occurred in early fall of 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it's probably something to do with reading a lot of off-the-grid weirdness on Reddit. Also, some of the details are a bit gray, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs and boggy swamps and other things that were similar to swamps and bogs. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to you guessed it, the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing ankle deep in water. Then it just got deeper and darker and boggier from there. We mucked about on Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, 
cooked dinner and just chilled out until it got dark. And it was crazy dark. No other campers around, just the light of our slowly dying fire. We begin to hear a slow splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe 100 feet out from our fire. One of the guys yelled something toward the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and more methodical. This time it was within 15 feet of the fire, but it was out of the fire's light. None of us were really concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured that it was just a deer or a raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly, the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. His light hit something, and he yelled, It's a man! and ran to the swamp burn. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam, and then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out in the darkness. So what did we do? We tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and somehow fell asleep. Nothing else did happen, and we went home the next day as scheduled. We had lots of stories about what it might have been, if it was a real person, if it was a ghost. Thinking back on it now, it must have been a piney, a local who knew the area really well. This man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to come check us out though, so it's still pretty creepy, even if it was just a man. The pines can be great and also eerie, and that weekend was both. For our anniversary, my wife and I rented a cabin around Divide, Colorado. Our last night there, it started to snow. We were laying in bed, just relaxing, and we started to clearly hear footsteps on the front porch of the cabin. Nobody should have been around. I went to check, and nobody was there. Being a believer in Bigfoot, I thought, well, maybe it's something like that. So I looked out the windows and there was no sign of anything anywhere. There was fresh snow on the ground and there were no prints. That's what I really thought was weird. I laid back down and it happened again. So I got up, looked around, and there weren't any prints or anything. It happened a third time after that. I couldn't figure out why there were no prints when we clearly heard footsteps on the front porch. Then we heard this wrestling noise coming from the roof. That happened a couple of times too, but I chose not to go outside to look. When I was, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway, the day passed by without incident and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away. The light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details, but it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, 
like if I left the tent, I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up, and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk, and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious. It just felt bad like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention, or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things, because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before, and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me and kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. Where do I begin? This had taken place a few years ago. 
I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had this weird way of hovering back and forth over my body, and my dog, who was curled up, awake, and not moving or making a sound, at the bottom of my feet. I look over and I see my best friend passed out and his dog. I'm unsure whether or not his dog was awake, but I was clearly the only one between my friend and I that was, and I'm experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what happened, and he replied no and thought that I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear or something, so we looked around our campsite but couldn't find any trace. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch, so even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it wouldn't have gotten into any of our food. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. I don't know if it was the wind or a deer or a bear, who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night we decided to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we were in Arizona. Before we settled in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making this huge splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything above us, so we run over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top and we see nobody. We yell out a bunch of foul stuff and heard nobody running off or anything like that. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up there, my friend told me that throughout the trip, since we started in Flagstaff, he's had rocks being thrown at him, even before that big ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that was impossible and that we were just trying to connect dots and have it be a cool adventure. Nothing happened that night and going into the next day where we packed up and headed home with nothing of a memory to be justified by. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what we encountered. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere and I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? 
and we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers, where the teacher had just talked to the class. We had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had sort of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually, at the top, we found this secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead and they didn't acknowledge my mom or I whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and then right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Neither of them had lights. They were totally barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I said I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought they were paranormal, he said, pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night so instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird. 
But again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car, and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console, and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to 10 miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then, after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them, from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato. So there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories too that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmont Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around. It was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no stakes and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. 
our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the stakes allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights, and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Some time later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take and packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and I jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and I hike for about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I managed to get a fire going. 
I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I go back to eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep yet. So I pull out a book I brought with me and I start to read by the light of the lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and I listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops and I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip up the tent and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and then sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm really hearing is what I'm really hearing, or if it's just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different. Old men, old women, younger people, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings, no laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a little bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the whole way, I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way out, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. I managed a resort in the Adirondack for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during the Prohibition. 
We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze, as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency and would visit my camp, for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. It started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened-in porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. So, after we were all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30 in the morning or so. We were laying there, and I was all tossing and turning because I'd been asleep and woken up, so I have a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We'd been laying there for about a half an hour or so, when I hear the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. I knew exactly what it sounded like. My first thought was that it was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters, so she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom, in the boathouse, for over an hour, is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three steps, onto the dance floor, and stopping right in front of the door to the screened-in porch. I lay there, just waiting for the door to open and for my boss to call my name. As the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door, walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, anything. But there was nothing. The rest of the night, I stayed up, stiff straight in my sleeping bag, no receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. Just my girlfriend, myself, the night, and an empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over to me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night waiting for some other sound to explain those footsteps in the night, and heard nothing. She was terrified. We never went into that boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go to the boathouse myself on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, Ever since that, there was always a sense of dread going in there, being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is that there's this enormous hanging bed in there in front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owners to take naps on during the day, hung on chains, so that the bed could be lifted out of the way for entertaining guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175-pound bed, swinging on its chains in the darkness of the boathouse. Until my last day at that camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging. One summer, I helped the Boy Scout troop that I was a part of, and we took the troop down to Antietam National Battlefield. I received my Eagle Award two years before, but wasn't particularly active afterwards. I liked camping and they needed a few leaders, so I decided to go. A number of other troops had also come down for the weekend, and we had a weekend full of Civil War education, reenactments, and troops pranking other troops. All of the troops were camped along Antietam Creek, on the other side of the Burnsides Bridge Road. That side isn't part of the park. It was pretty easy for anyone to cross the road and walk onto the battlefield to go up to Burnside's Bridge, along the creek, and see the field where the Union soldiers massed and tried to cross the bridge. I grew up outside of Gettysburg, so ghost stories about Antietam didn't bother me at all. 
There's enough weird tales in Gettysburg that other battlefields really didn't faze me. The second night that we were there, the troops all hit the hay early due to the fact that they were made to march all day by an overzealous reenactor. I took a walk over to the bridge right after dinner and the sun was slowly sinking towards night. It was actually quite beautiful seeing the field and the creek. I walked up to the bridge and started to cross it when I felt an excruciating sharp pain in my chest. I almost doubled over in pain and clenched my chest. I thought maybe I was having a heart attack, but both of my arms were fine and free to move. I put both hands on the part of my chest that hurt and felt another sharp pain right below the top of my right shoulder, in the meaty part above your pecs, underneath your shoulder and just in front of your underarm. That pain came and knocked me down, where I almost cracked my head open on the side of the stone bridge. I laid there, freaking out, and scrambled to my feet and booked it back to camp. I got back to camp and had the other scoutmaster take a look at my chest. I have these two raised red lumps that under the skin you could see were turning into blood blisters. He asked me what I was doing, and I told him that it happened when I was just walking around the battlefield. Not once had I thought about a haunting or anything like that. I called in an evening and turned in. The next morning, after breakfast, the troops were scheduled to meet with a park official at Burnside's Bridge. Our troop and about four other ones stood on the battlefield facing toward the bridge where the park official was detailing the history of the battle. When he talked about the bridge, then I paid more attention. I found out that Confederate sharpshooters took up positions on the other side of the creek and that on the side where we were all at was the Union. The Union soldiers were supposed to take the bridge and were just picked off left and right up on that bridge. Confederates lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 soldiers and the Union lost over 15,000. No Union soldier ever made it past the halfway point of the bridge. At this point, my scoutmaster just looks at me and I'm wondering what the hell happened to me the night before. I'm pretty sure that I felt ghost bullets and to this day, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever had happen to me. And this happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird, and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced or who or what I had seen. So I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it. About four years ago, we had to live with my mom's friend for a while. The day we came to her house, we were moving things in and I went out to get some of the last things in the car. When I went outside, sitting in the car, clutching the steering wheel was my mom's friend, staring at me wearing a red dress with her hair down. I knew it wasn't her because I had just seen her 10 seconds earlier in the house with her hair up in a bun and she was wearing a light pink sweater with white pants. 
I ran back inside and found my mom and her friend talking in the kitchen. I told them what I had seen. We looked out of the window of the living room where the car could be seen from and nobody was there. None of us left the house for the rest of the night. We finished getting the stuff out of the car the next day. That was not the last paranormal thing that happened to us in that house. Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow and had an orange red tint to it. It almost looked like a fireball. It's night and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started like flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form and kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it, moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back, but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, Nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago, around the same time. My aunt stepped back outside and called me over, fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red, and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding, stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine, nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. 
so they started walking. They weren't too far and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking as it's all they could do. They keep going and sure enough, up ahead down the road, there's a parked car, the same as before. This time they are tripping out and they run up to it and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked but she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild.
I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two coworkers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my coworkers was outside smoking when he called to me and another coworker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building, two stories, so maybe 30 feet. I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights with the largest at the bottom center of the V with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location, changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, then back to a V, before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two, I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m. Even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. I'm a scout leader in Ireland, and my friend group are all outdoorsy people, so I've done my fair share of outdoor adventures. One time, we were away, camping down on a site in Roscommon. There were about four of us in a dome tent that night, and each one of us heard rustling and moving around outside our tent during the night. We were all scared shitless and didn't mention it to each other until the next morning over breakfast with the others from our group. It wasn't until then that the two others in the other tents spoke up about hearing rustling right outside of their tents as well and something rubbing along their tent wall. Well, we were all convinced that it had to be a wild animal since there were no other people on our site. We had two nights left. It wasn't our first or our last time there. We've stayed there roughly around 15 times, give or take. And while I believe there are wild deer around, I've never seen them in person, not once. There are always people down there on the site where we stay, so surely, wild animals would stay clear of that area 
and wouldn't come right up to the tent walls, right? Another time, while wild camping near Glindalo, several of us in a tent woke up several times to the sound of the zipper on our tent door. It wasn't just a small zipper noise. It was as if the exterior door were being fully zipped open or closed. There were two tents, so two groups, but we all decided to kip in together because of how cold it was. So it was nobody from our group joking with us. It could easily have been another group, but while wild camping, the chances of another person or group being close to you are slim. Once we looked around and knew that the door, to our knowledge, hadn't been zipped, and that we weren't in immediate danger, we chose to ignore it. It happened a few times that night. You kind of learn, while camping, to ignore weird noises and movements outdoors. Most nights spent camping, you don't get much sleep, really. You're always conscious of being in the wilderness, and so exposed. It might not be the creepiest of stories. Most of our weird camping or hiking experiences have happened abroad, to be fair. But all the same, it still hasn't put us off camping or being outdoors. Even if we can't be sure what's out there. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown, and I would take him with me everywhere. In the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail. I had the same exact dream every time, and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair with my clown doll sitting in it staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, open, with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors, the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose. And on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad 
and I told it to leave me alone and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point haunting me. I started getting really into it and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me and he said something for the first time and I woke up. I can't remember what it was, I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave, or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me, and I have them on my desk, and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart-opening, for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object, same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional, though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, 
Yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name, and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there, was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye, and ushered my boyfriend away from her, because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her, and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered that I am 100% sure is haunted, and maybe even malicious. Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I've developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I've grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m., and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences, but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. I saw a UFO and I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were, it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? It was definitely a UFO because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object. I just want to know if it was alien or not. So I'm currently 16 and this happened when I was three. I'm from New Zealand. We have this RNZAF Air Force Base called Ohakia. 
Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing. Those big, tall bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. Then they stop, then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning. It starts to move along the tree line again. And then it just flies off to the left and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back. But we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different. But to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good when suddenly a person steps in front of my view coming from the field side. He was maybe five or 10 feet away. So I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy and I didn't. I was sure of it but the guy wasn't in my view anymore. So I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car, no dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So, I brushed it off as much as one could, and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow, because he was standing right next to my door, and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, Yoo-hoo! And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard. So I stepped back and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time. 
But my grandpa often likes sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. We don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom and our bedroom was next to the bathroom. So we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching, like a soldier, and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features. So we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply. So we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot so it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area, and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it, because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle wearing the same clothing. But what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways and everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. I want to tell you a story about my mother's encounter with a doppelganger. It was about nine years ago when my mom was doing a late shift. She was still an accountant at the time so she had to work extra hours to complete her work. She told me that at about 11.20, she went for a quick coffee when she sighted a person exactly like her that went past by the break room. She thought she was just being paranoid and that her eyes were tired. She was scared that it was a thief though, so she brought her personal bag with her just in case. She went down for the coffee, then came back to the working station. But as she stood at the door of the break room, the doppelganger was standing there right by the computer. My mother was terrified, 
as it just stood there, looking at the computer. Luckily, a security officer was doing his last rounds to turn off the electricity, and he saw my mom. He touched her, which brought her back to reality. But this time, the officer noticed the doppelganger. He seemed to understand what was going on and proceeded to escort my mom out of the building. When they were outside, he explained to her that it was a bad omen and told her to change where she worked. She did and got a promotion about two months after the incident. She never saw her double again. At around 11 years old, I was in my room, sleeping on the top bunk. My sister was asleep on the bottom bunk. Across from my bed was my dresser with a large mirror. If you're laying and you look to the left, the mirror is there. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking at the mirror, and I saw what looked like myself sitting on the bottom bunk, staring at me through the mirror with a grin. Except she looked like she was sitting backwards so that she had to turn her head to look toward the mirror, if that makes sense. I was really confused and really creeped out. I stared at it for a while, thinking that maybe it was my sister. I even called out her name, but it wasn't. I strained my eyes to try and see better in the dim lighting, but I got too freaked out, so I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I find a handprint on the mirror. I was beyond spooked at this point. That house always had weird activity too. Bottles in the bathroom randomly crashing down. Once I heard a man shout, hey, when I was alone and leaving for school. Very strange house. I know some might say that this was a dream and maybe it was, but I know that I was wide awake. It felt so real. I remember it vividly. I remember trying to get back to sleep afterward. I'll never forget, though, the feeling of staring at myself, staring back at me, so menacingly. Has anyone else noticed an increase in doppelganger sightings recently? I just had one yesterday at the library where I work. My coworker and I saw a patron a regular who we see almost every day walk in in sweatpants. Neither of us saw him leave. About 15 minutes later, the same man walked in through the one and only entrance and exit, this time wearing something completely different and more formal. My coworker and I stared at each other, completely puzzled. I asked him how he had walked past me so fast that I didn't even notice and why he had changed clothes. He looked at me like I was crazy. He claimed that he had been home all day and this was his first time stopping by. My coworker told him what happened and he was visibly freaked out. It freaked us all out because we looked around for this doppelganger and whoever it was had completely vanished. There is, like I said, only one way in and one way out for patrons. The other doors are either emergency exits which would have set off the alarms, or the staff entrance, which is a highly restricted area. There was no way he could have left in that short a time without at least one of us noticing. There are no cameras in the building, so there's no way to see how this person could have left. But the only phenomenon that I can attribute this to is the mystery of doppelgangers. I'm very interested in the paranormal, but I'm not a researcher or an investigator. Just a fan, I guess. It seems like there's been an increase in doppelganger sightings. Has anyone else noticed this? I wonder what it could mean. I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, 
just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watch the star for roughly five minutes, when we notice two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around 7 or 8 at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away, and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color, and had, well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of, like, ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular, ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle, and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large, and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white, all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side, where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving, and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split for a few moments, it kept pace with the car. Then each half, while still on its side, 
shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break, then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say, ohm. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way. And it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room. At that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out.
The experience that I'm relaying here happened to one of my best friends who stays with his grandmother who's in her mid eighties. One day, her daughter picked her up and they went shopping together. My friend Rob went into his bedroom to watch TV right after they left. About a half an hour later, he heard some noise coming from the kitchen. So he poked his head out the door to see what it was. He saw his grandmother in the kitchen, facing away from him, digging furiously through her junk drawer, obviously searching for something. He just shrugged and went back into his room. Another hour and a half passes and he comes out into the living room. That's when he see his aunt's van pull up to the house and his grandmother and aunt come in carrying all of her parcels. He then became uneasy and asked her if she found what she was looking for in the kitchen. She looked at him like he was nuts and said that she had been gone for hours and that she had never been looking in the kitchen drawer that day. He then explained that he had seen her and that whoever it was had on the exact same clothes and the same hair. He started laughing, thinking that she was just trolling him, but his aunt looked very concerned and verified that they had not returned after their initial departure. Rob began to freak out, and when he told me what happened later that day, he was glad that he didn't see its face, whatever it was. I believe him, because he's never told a story even remotely close to this one, and he seemed really unsettled by the whole incident. Honestly, I would be too. About five years ago, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument right after our son was first born. We were all heading to the pharmacy that morning, but both of us being immature decided to go separately. I had the day off, so I brought my son with me. It was only about a quarter of a mile up the street from my house, so we planned on walking. Well, I left a little late and I didn't see my wife in the house prior to me leaving because of us avoiding each other. And when I got about a minute from there, I see my wife turn the corner. So I'm kind of not looking at her. But then when we pass, we both kind of mean mugged each other and didn't say a word. I go in, I get my script and I get home. Well, she's laying on the couch in her pajamas and not even getting ready for work. So I tapped her and I said, what the heck, you're not getting ready for work. Why did you change out of your clothes? Are you not going to work now? And she was like, what are you talking about? I've been laying here in my pajamas. I'm just gonna go get my script and a few things that I was gonna get later. I was like, you didn't go to the pharmacy earlier? I just walked past you like 10 to 15 minutes ago when you were leaving. You gave me that evil, dirty look, so I gave you the same one in return. She starts saying that I'm crazy and must have been hallucinating and what did I take? I totally didn't believe her. I thought she was just gaslighting me, trying to make me feel like I was losing my mind. But later that night when we were cooled down, we all went to Walmart together to get her scripts and a few of the things that she needed. I literally felt like I was in the twilight zone. I kept saying like, come on, Jill, quit messing with me. She swore up and down and actually started getting a little irritated that I kept pressing her about it. Ultimately, I believe her that she had never left the house. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. After I believed her that it really wasn't her, things started sticking out to me, like the look she gave me and how things about her face just were a little off. Even when she's mad at me, the look that she gives me is never that evil. And that's exactly what this look was, just evil. Like even at resting neutrality, this face would have been full of evil and hatred. It was just like that. But still at the time we locked eyes and I was totally convinced it was my wife. I still have no idea what happened. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse and we've had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises and so on. We've had paranormal investigators over to our house and we're waiting on the report. 
Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway. Apparently, I was buck naked. He called my name and he said that whoever this was turned her face toward him and gave him a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column going the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to. When my husband said he was talking to me, my son said that I wasn't there. He'd never seen me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub and he made me swear up and down that I had never left the tub. He was very freaked out and made us follow him from room to room for the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months prior. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. And also she told me to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. It's easily the weirdest thing we've ever experienced. Does anyone else have a doppelganger story? I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this, and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance, and in front of it there was an open, empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees, and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house, to the left, and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something. And right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs. Plus, there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night. I dismissed it as the wind, cliche I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then. Still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. It started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed a light on it, it disappeared but the eerie feeling stayed there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. 
Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day. And on some days, I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before, and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it, since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold, and my parents were just whipping me into helping her. But it was no use, and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop, and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise, and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window, and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage, and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again, and things got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real, and there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging, and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason. I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance, and in front of it there was an open, empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees, and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house, to the left, and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something. 
and right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs, plus there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night I dismissed it as the wind, cliche I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed it started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed light on it, it disappeared, but the eerie feeling stayed there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day, and on some days I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold and my parents were just whipping me into helping her, but it was no use and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window, and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again and things got calmer. 
We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real. And there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason. So my grandpa has this ranch about 25 miles east of Pace in Arizona. For those in Arizona, it's between Heigler Creek and the 260. It's very secluded, but the land is good for grazing. I spend a lot of time running Jersey cattle on the range. Every night, one of us rides out to check on the cattle in the field and to check the fence line for holes in the wire. A few days ago, I was riding out to check on the herd at about 1.30 in the morning, and I kept hearing this rustling in the tree line running along the fence perimeter. I figured it was just coyotes or squirrels. I see a lot of them up there. It went away every 10 or 15 minutes, and then I heard it again. The second time I heard it, I was off my horse and walking him to a little water trough. The cows were about 150 to 200 yards away, just within my view, given the moonlight. I heard the rustling again, but this time it was heavy. My horse Vegas and I both looked up at the same time, wondering what in the hell we were hearing. At this point, I came to the eerie realization that whatever was out there was tracking Vegas and I, and it didn't seem so interested in the cows. In an attempt to scare it off, I got back on my horse and grabbed my whip and uncoiled it. Don't worry, I don't use it on animals. I only use it to make a loud noise to move the cattle along. I cracked it a few times, figured that was safer than using my pistol. The rustling stopped and the forest was dead quiet once more. Not thinking much about it, I went back to count the head. I marked 38 heads, all the cows were there. So I started my way back to the house. I was about three and a half miles away and it's a bit of a trail ride to get back. It was about 10 minutes of silence until I heard that rustling again. At this point, I was getting pissed. I figured it was some dumb little coyote thinking that we were going to lead him somewhere. So I called my grandpa on my radio. There's zero service out there, like none whatsoever. So radios are our only communication. I told him I was going to fire my gun so that he didn't get worried when he heard it. I reached down and pulled my revolver from my side and I fired one round into the air. The rustling stopped as the shot rang out through the woods and mountains. My ears rang and the smell of gunpowder filled my nose as the smoke settled. After I calmed Vegas down, I started riding back only for the rustling to return five minutes later. I started getting really nervous at this point because usually coyotes run away when they get scared by a loud noise and they don't usually return that quickly. I didn't have a flashlight on me because I'm dumb and forgot. So I used the lame iPhone flashlight and dismounted. I slowly walked to the tree line where I had heard the rustling since I had my gun out ready for an animal to jump at me or something. I flashed my light around through the clearing in the trees. To my right, I heard rustling about a hundred feet away. I looked over and to my surprise and confusion, I saw a black silhouette of a horse running across the trail. I immediately thought, oh crap, is that one of our horses? Is that someone else's horse? So I got back on my horse and rode over to where I had seen it, shaking with anxiety. I looked around and was confused. I had no idea how that horse had even run into or out of the forest because it was so thick with shrubbery. And when I looked back behind me to start riding back, I stopped frozen in fear and got the chills. I dropped my gun and heard the sound of it hitting the ground 
because in front of me, about 50 feet away, was the silhouette of a man wearing a flat-brimmed hat who appeared to have chaps on. I picked up my gun and aimed at the figure, and it was gone. I got back on Vegas and rode like the wind to get out of there, constantly looking behind me in fear of it following. I made it back and told my grandpa. He tried to calm me down, and that's when he told me that he had had some weird experiences too. We had a lot of paranormal activity in this old farmhouse that we lived in. Little things would happen. We would hear voices or something would turn on and we would just ignore it. Until one night. My husband and I were watching Stranger Things. Ironically, in the show, it was just after the lights had flicked out. Ours started to do the same thing. I made a small joke and thought nothing of it. As I went into the kitchen, I watched our vase go into the air maybe an inch and fall. Again, I thought it was creepy, but I didn't think a whole lot of it. My husband did end up getting an EVP, but unfortunately we lost it once we moved out of there. Anyway, we heard a pig on the EVP and keys. We also heard a female saying, Abby. We had a lot of other things happen in that house too. I'm not sure if it's just a ghost or if it's a demon. So far, every house I've lived in seems to have paranormal activity. My brother seems to have a lot of paranormal activity too, but he won't share what exactly has happened to him. I used to try to get recordings in his place, but he told me to stop and to stop messing with it. So out of respect, I did. I think whatever this thing is, is attached to my brother. I think that because he recently stayed with us for the weekend and I had my first paranormal experience in this new house. I had one of the doors slam with force, not because of air drafts or anything like that, and the stove kicked on. All of this happened right after he left. I don't know if I'm being paranoid or if something is following him around, but I'm pretty sure that something is attached to him. That or we picked something up from the farm, but honestly, I really don't know what's going on. This took place in a small city in Alaska where I grew up. One night at approximately 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I was lying awake. I'm a very light sleeper and I often have trouble falling asleep. At about that time, I started hearing what sounded like an obnoxious mix of possibly a clarinet or a trumpet playing loud screeches. No harmony, just squeaks and honks in the cold night air. I sat for a while on my bed. I couldn't sleep. It was loud enough for me to hear inside. I went out the front door and stood on the porch and just listened. It sounded like whoever was playing it was a few blocks away. But at the same time, it was as though you could hear it in every direction. It was autumn and very cold at the time. I was so frustrated by the screeching in the late hour that I actually yelled out, shut up, thinking it was a kid playing a prank. About a year or two later, when I had nearly forgotten about it, I heard the sound again this time in the daytime in the winter air. It lasted for a few hours and then quit. It wasn't until probably five years after this that I watched a video on YouTube called Trumpets in the Sky about people around the world hearing the exact same noises and not being able to find any explanation for them. It literally gave me the chills. But now it has me wondering, has anyone else experienced the same thing? All during my childhood, up until recently, I had thought that ghouls were just spooky, imaginative, scary monsters that would come out on Halloween night. But now, I know differently. I now believe they are synonymous with the creatures we know as crawlers. 
In Arabic folklore, the ghoul is said to dwell in cemeteries and other uninhabited places. Some say that a ghoul is a desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demon that can assume the guise of an animal. It lures unwary people into the desert or into abandoned places to slay and devour them. The creature also preys on young children, drinks blood, steals coins, and eats the dead. It can also take the form of a human. It is a particularly monstrous character believed to inhabit the wilderness of Afghanistan and Iran. The Galu demons were known to be part of the underworld and were thought to carry their victims off to the land of the dead to devour them. People who traveled near cemeteries and abandoned buildings or through desert wastelands were warned to be especially vigilant against these creatures. They were thought to be bipedal, though with a hunched form, and were known to crawl and sometimes run on all four limbs like an animal. I knew there was a reason why I kept warning people to stay away from the forests and surrounding areas. Since we have fewer deserts in the United States, these creatures are frequently encountered in wooded areas in addition to cemeteries. After years of research, I've come to the conclusion that crawlers are actually demons, interdimensional demons. The late great father Malachi Martin in his book, Hostage to the Devil, stated, quote, there is a dimension that is devoid of love and compassion, all the qualities that make us human, end quote. I believe it is from that dimension which these demon crawlers come. People from the Middle East are far more familiar with the ghouls. They are able to shapeshift and spend time in cemeteries as they feed off the flesh of the dead. Like I said, I used to think these were just stories meant for Halloween and scaring kids. But the more research I do, the more I believe they're real. And I think we all ought to be vigilant. A few months ago, I read a terrifying post about something that happened in the backwoods in Canyon Lake, Texas. I had commented that I nearly threw my phone because I used to live there for a few years. I truly don't know where to begin this story. I moved there my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, it's just most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. I never really understood why until the event started happening. The house was finished the summer going into my junior year. When we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently it sounded as if somebody had knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinet doors and the doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated dramatically from here. We would hear something in the woods, just outside of the porch lights continually. First, we thought it was an injured animal, but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see inhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers, and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad constantly hosted events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures and people in the house. The worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming, and it sounded as if somebody was walking up and down the stairs, going into every room, opening and closing the doors. I could go on and on about the things I saw in that house, 
it was one of the scariest times of my life. All in all, don't go to Canyon Lake. I like to look out for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, about 10 years ago, I'm in western Pennsylvania, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out-of-the-way stream that I had found on the map. I'm in the country. It's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be. So I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe the stream is located. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of the trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random places in the road, first sporadically, and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It almost looks like they were placed there on purpose. My car is four-wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger. Combined with this is how tight the road is now. Driving around them starts to get a little sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly so I don't pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn, but I stop as I see the road continuing down on this weird trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around. But it's also at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but if I didn't want to get my front end caught on something that might be pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck, I just couldn't do it. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you're bound to just get enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it's just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers. Then I start seeing toys. Kids' toys. Lots of them. Like an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not like one random mattress. Lots of them. All over the place, and there are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to get out of there, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out what my next move is, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks all of the way back up and out. I do this until the path levels out again. I was in full F this mode, and I just risk making the three-point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank, and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. 
Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. Worst case, I don't even want to think about it. All I know is ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts to tell me to get out, I get out. This story happened to me in the backwoods. It's not paranormal, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. I work in forestry, and I had a bear that was clearly not afraid of me and did not want to leave me alone. I pulled into our campsite at around 1 a.m. with the truck and trailer, and it's just me out there. I've got to set up two generators, one for the trailer so I don't freeze to death, and one to keep the equipment that we use warm so we can actually use it in the morning and the batteries don't die. I also got there late because I was having truck problems. I had no idea what the cause of them was. It kept dying and then it would be fine, repeating this process over and over. I set up the generator for the trailer and as I was getting the second one out of the truck, I hear a branch snap loudly. I stop and listen, and I can hear more branches snapping and some rustling in the trees. About 50 meters away into the trees, this noise keeps happening, and it's getting closer. I thought it was a person at first, so I yelled, who's there, and got no reply. The noises come right up to the edge of the clearing I'm in, a circle maybe 40 meters across and then they stop. I know whoever it is is just sitting there watching me. After about 15 seconds of me listening hard, half in the truck, I see two eyes appear, and then they rise up to about six feet in the air. I could tell it was a bear by the way it moved, which was actually a relief, because for one, it meant that it wasn't a skinwalker, and two, because I knew that there were only black bears around there and no grizzlies. But I didn't have anything to really defend myself with. No bear spray or gun or bear bangers, anything like that. I yelled at the bear, nothing. I hopped in the truck and pulled the air horn out. It didn't even move. I slowly walked over to the trailer, which was still hooked up to the truck, and grabbed a pot and pan and just started smashing them together at it while yelling. It still didn't move at all. It just stood there, staring at me. It wasn't making any noises either. No huffing or pawing at the ground like I knew bears do if they get upset. But that didn't exactly put my mind at ease, considering that this thing was clearly not afraid of me. Eventually, after about 15 minutes of making loud noises and it doing nothing but staring at me, it finally dropped to the ground, turned around, and started to walk away. I waited for about five minutes since I still had to set up the second generator, which I had to bring closer to the bear. Picture a triangle. I was at one corner, the bear was at another, and where I needed to bring the generator was at the third. Right as I pulled the generator out of the truck, I hear branches snapping again, and it's coming back. It came back to the edge of the clearing and did the exact same thing. Stood there, staring at me, and wouldn't leave with all the noise I was making. Again, after another 15 minutes of it sitting there, motionless, it left again, and I quietly dragged the generator out, started it, ran back to the other generator, started that one, got in the trailer and shut the door and watched out the window for a while at where it kept coming back to. It never showed up again. Maybe it did after I went to bed, but there was no sign of it in the morning. I know it's not the most insane thing that's ever happened to anybody, but it was intensely disturbing knowing that this thing could easily kill me and wasn't afraid of me and didn't want to leave. It remained so perfectly still, staring at me for such a long time, and I couldn't do anything about it because I had half set up the trailer already and I couldn't leave quickly. Even if I could, there was no guarantee my truck would even start, and I still had a job to do, 
that required me leaving the probably illusionary safety of the truck and go closer to the bear in a way that would mean that if it decided I was worth the trouble, it could get to me faster than I could get back into the truck. I've had other experiences. I had a grizzly charge my truck down at top speed up north, then decided halfway to me that I was a lot bigger than it was and wasn't worth it. Everybody knows bears are fast, but there's a difference between reading the number 50 kilometers per hour or even seeing a video and seeing it in person. An animal that big has no right to move that quickly. It just seems unnatural. I've also heard plenty of very odd noises at night, and the feeling of being watched at night is nearly constant. I stay overnight way in the middle of nowhere alone on a regular basis for my job, and it's very easy to psych yourself out, late at night, alone, with no way to contact anyone, except for unreliable GPS text messaging, and hours from anything resembling civilization. I've been doing this for years, and I'm still not used to it. I've definitely encountered a skinwalker or something like it once, but that's another story for another time, and was before I started this job. Anyway, that's my bear that wouldn't leave me alone story. Hope you enjoyed it. For some background, I'm 23 and I have lived in the country all my life, growing up on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and moving to the west side as a teenager. This story takes place when I was 17, and it's true. A few years after my family moved, I started dating my boyfriend at the time. I lived within the small town, but my boyfriend lived about 15 minutes out, surrounded by woods. His only neighbor was about a mile down, I'm using miles because country roads here are done in mile sections, not kilometers. On a September night, I was at his house watching movies and things like that. I wanted to go out for a cigarette at about 2 a.m. He said he didn't want one, but for some reason, I felt scared to go outside by myself, probably because I was really tired and kind of out of it, so I made him come out with me anyway. We go out onto the front deck in the dark. He's looking at his phone. I'm smoking and enjoying that crisp fall air. Then I heard this distant cry come from the direction of the neighbor's house. It kind of sounded like it could be a dog or a coyote. I asked my boyfriend what he thought it was, to which he replied he thought it was the neighbor's dog. We were both leaning against the house, listening to it and we noticed that it was slowly getting louder, as though it was getting closer. Then it changed in pitch and tone dramatically and became guttural. It sounded something like a human screeching for their life, but it definitely wasn't human. The type of scream that just immediately makes you feel sick to your stomach and terrified. My blood turned to ice the back of my neck was prickling, and we both just froze. We were just staring at each other, looking around and then back to each other, but our feet would move. I don't think I can even fully explain what it sounded like. Again, I've lived in the country all my life. This didn't sound like any wildlife that I have ever heard of. I know people's first response is that cougars and coyotes and foxes can sound like people, but I know firsthand what those calls sound like, and this wasn't that. We listened to that awful sound getting closer and louder for probably two minutes before my boyfriend grabbed my arm and rushed inside. We never lock our doors where I'm from, but damn did we lock every door and window in the house that night. We jumped into bed, freaking out, trying to make sense of what the heck that was. And we could still somewhat hear it, even from where we were inside. We laid there silently for about 10 minutes. And then out of nowhere, it just stopped. Obviously, we didn't sleep much. The next day, we drove past the neighbor's house and dog was fine, just chilling in the driveway. 
Nothing was out of the ordinary and it never happened again. To this day, that sound freaks me out. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin. I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow. But then I saw it again. And this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment. So I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first, I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs. When it finally hit me, I was alone in the cabin. So whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. I live in Northern Alabama. I was out rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of the creek with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag, and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and then, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? 
Ten minutes go by and I'm walking farther up the creek. And damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. Something really did seem off though, and I started to feel uneasy. So much so that I turned around and headed back to my sight. Something about the meow just wasn't right. Wasn't a painful meow, but just a matter of fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back, I definitely heard a cat meow. I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat, but instantly I feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something was imitating a cat. I keep focused on getting back to my sight and about five minutes later, I hear another single meow. Here's where I realize that things are getting really strange. The meow always sounded the exact same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reached my sight and pulled out my drinks and plopped down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time, I knew with everything in me that it was not a cat that was following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car. There was another long meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and I was really starting to lose my mind. I get my keys and mace out and I put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did. I nearly crapped myself finding the courage to make it to my car, but I did and I hightailed it out of there, fast. I know that the rational answer is that somebody was out there messing with me, but how did they get back there and why? It's like 200 acres of forest. People don't go back there all that often. I'd have to believe that somebody went back there, sat around and waited for somebody to mess with. And how did they follow me without me hearing a crunch or anything? To this day, I can't explain what in the world happened that day, but something was off. About a year and a half ago, my girlfriend and I went down to Ohio Pile State Park. We frequent there as we live an hour away and it's one of the best parks within a day's trip for us to hike and swim, mushroom hunt and explore in general. So one day we got bored of the normal hiking areas and places that we had already been. So we decided to drive around the back roads, deeper into the woods of the park, no map, just deciding which way to turn when we got to intersections and going from there. We pass a random old cemetery. It couldn't have been a mile or more down the road when we noticed a more dirt-like road, kind of dilapidated, with a chain in front of it so cars couldn't go in. We decided to park the car and go explore the trail in general. There were no signs for no trespassing or anything like that so we continued on. I'll never forget the eerie feeling I had as soon as we made it onto the trail or road. Just a general sense of, you shouldn't be here. But I don't listen to that feeling. My girlfriend seems intrigued. There's no one at all around, and it seems like a beautiful secluded area. We head back some more and we notice that up a cutoff was an abandoned visitor center so obviously we had to go check it out. This is when things started to get really creepy. We were about a hundred feet away from the building when that alarm in my head that said, you shouldn't be here, intensified immensely. But I was curious about the building still, and my girlfriend at this time is freaking out internally. She wants to leave and she feels uneasy and unwelcome. I want to explore the building because I love abandoned places. 
In the amount of time it took us to cover that 100 feet, I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent. There were no bugs anymore, no birds, not even the sound of branches swaying in the wind. We get up to the building and my girlfriend is pleading that we go back. I said, let's just take a step in and then we can go. I'm approaching the stairs to the door from the left side and no joke, straight out of a cheesy horror movie, a bird out of nowhere flies into the window of the building. Not five seconds later, I heard what sounded like either a log or a very large branch cracking on the other side of the building. I'd like to clarify that there was no way it was a small branch or twig. It sounded almost like a tree breaking directly on the other side of the building. I pulled out my pistol and walked quickly backwards facing the building and I told my girlfriend to walk as quickly and as quietly as she could back to the car. We hopped in and left as quickly as the car would go and drive. I'm still not entirely sure what happened. I know that black bears do reportedly live in the area, though you don't see them too often and I've never seen one there. But like I said, I suppose it's a possibility, although it doesn't really explain the bird. The second possibility that comes to mind is that it was another human. But the thing that broke didn't sound like a human walking over a branch and breaking it. Like I said, it sounded like a tree snapping when it starts to fall. I've recently gotten into Appalachian folklore and stories, and I've been reading about Wendigos, skinwalkers, crawlers, and such. So for my question, I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a similar experience in Pennsylvania or in general, and if so, what happened? And what do you think it could have been? My girlfriend and I could never figure out why we felt so afraid. Like I said, it could have been an animal and the bird could have been a coincidence, but we both felt an overwhelming feeling like we shouldn't be there. And it still gives me goosebumps. I live in Northeastern America in a pretty rural place with lots of hills, not too many neighbors and a lot of forest. Just tonight, I was headed with my mother down our backyard, which is large and relatively clear for about a hundred feet. Then it switches to woods. We got to about 30 feet before the woods and I caught sight of some eyes reflecting in my headlamp. They were a good 50 to 100 feet away and I assumed that they belonged to deer. But a few things convinced me that they might not be. Around where I live, deer will run away if you make enough noise. And we were talking pretty loudly, but the eyes weren't moving. They kept staring directly at us, which is incredibly unlike deer in this area. On top of that, the pair of eyes on the right were very low to the ground and very wide set too far apart to be deer considering the distance. We stood for a minute remarking on them and neither pair of eyes looked away. So since we were spooked, we headed back up to the house, got my brother and a machete and a bat and a metal pole. I know a little overkill, but our area has been a little scary lately. We headed back down I expected the eyes to be gone by that point. I mean, that's how these things usually go, right? But no, they were still there in slightly different spots than they had been, but not much farther from where they'd been previously. They stared just as steadily as they had before. So we retreated back inside. The logical answer is deer, but the lack of running away, intent staring, and wide set eyes feel like that option is ruled out. Another thought is wild dogs, but we don't really have those in our area. It's possible it could have been a black bear, but those are notoriously scared of people. If anyone has thoughts on what this might have been, let me know. Edit. As an update, just to provide more information, 
there were no visible signs of anything in the area as far as I could tell. The next day I looked for marks on the trees from climbing and saw none. There's a good amount of greenery covering the ground, so it's difficult to look for scat. But there were no signs of any animals having lied down on the ground. We've still been unable to find any evidence that it was something natural. A few years ago, in the northern part of Sweden, I'm going out for a nice evening of fishing. I'm what I guess is called a fishing supervisor. I check that the other fishermen got their licenses, and I do this at a certain area of lakes and streams. This was in late summer, and I had just been doing my rounds, which I usually end by going to a small lake and fly fishing for some trout. This lake, or pond, is pretty deep in the forest, and I rarely see other people out there. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen someone else out there. This lake looks kind of like a crater. It's a perfectly round circle, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, and it contains a natural population of perch and trout. It was a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds were chirping, and the fish were rising to inspect the spawning insects on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish, rising to the right in front of me. At the moment that my fly lands on the surface, it's like somebody pressed the pause button on time. The sun hides behind a cloud. The wind stops blowing. The birds are suddenly silent, and the fish stops eating. A smell rises from the ground that I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something rotten, almost as though I had a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware that there's something walking out of the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters away. It's like I can see it out of the corner of my eye, but still can't see it at the same time. Every hair on my body is on end, and suddenly it's very cold all around me. The thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it, because I don't dare to move. Then the wind hits me, and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again, a bird is singing somewhere in the forest, and the almost overwhelming feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around, and there's nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again. I packed my gear and threw the backpack on my back and ran for it. I ran through the forest to my car. I hit the gas and I drove like a maniac until I found the big road and civilization once more. I pulled over to the side of the road and just said to myself, what the heck was that? My heart was still racing. I haven't visited the lake since this happened, and I don't know anybody else who has either, so I'm not sure if anybody else has experienced something similar. I've probably visited this place 20 times or more before this happened, and nothing like that had ever happened. The only thing I'm ever really afraid of out there is bears. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that are pretty deep in the forest. There's always a lot of wildlife in these places. Deer, moose, foxes, and the occasional wolf or bobcat, and maybe a bear. I've never been afraid of meeting anybody or any scary person. In fact, other than being cautious about wildlife, I have never really been afraid of anything, except when visiting this particular lake from that point on. My friends and I are on our way from Chicago back to our home in Evansville, Indiana. As such, we have to drive through the Midwestern country to get there pitch black highways surrounded by trees and cornfields. About four hours away from home, my friend screams and I look up. 
We hit a deer going 50. The poor guy bounced off the front end and was probably dead on impact. We come to a stop and commiserate, call our parents, etc. We're stranded on a quiet highway in the middle of nowhere, trees to our right and a few houses a bit far off to our left, all surrounded by cornfields, of course. My friend is standing outside surveying the damage when we hear a scream, a man's scream, a bit far off to our left. My other friend and I look at each other, wide-eyed. A few minutes pass and we hear one again. I make a joke about skinwalkers and my friend gets back in the car. A bit later, after calling 911, we heard another scream, a woman this time, and it seemed closer. We're waiting on the deputy and nervously joking about whether it's skinwalkers or just crazy woodland people. And my friend facing the trees suddenly laughs nervously and rolls up the window. She goes, I just heard clicking noises outside my window and I'm rolling it up because I'm not going to pretend like I just didn't hear that. I know that clicking noises are often a thing with skinwalker stories and things like that. We're not really sure what happened. We think maybe something was trying to lure us out into the woods, but we didn't go, obviously. Obviously we survived too, but I don't think any of us are going to forget that experience anytime soon. This happened to me when I was in high school, living with my parents. One night, I went out with friends. I drank a couple of beers and I went back home. I was just a little tipsy, not drunk, and I decided to take a shower before going to bed. It was about one to two in the morning. The shower cabin that we had wasn't fixed to the floor or the walls. It was like a capsule, but it was very heavy and hard to move. I entered the shower and after a few minutes, the cabin started swinging left to right and it was very loud. I was standing trying not to move and it stopped, but as soon as I continued to shower again, it started swinging again. I stepped outside and there was my dad banging on the bathroom door asking what I was doing because the noise woke him up. I just got dressed and went to bed. The next morning, my dad asked me again what that noise was, and I tried to explain what happened. He said that I was just drunk and fell in the shower, so I moved the cabin. But that did not happen. I know that it didn't happen. I wasn't drunk. I had had maybe two beers. And I was standing the whole time. I had never fallen. It moved by itself, something that should have been impossible. I went to the bathroom and tried very hard to move or swing the cabin back and forth, but it was impossible. I still have no idea what happened that night. My grandparents used to live in the Ozarks in a tiny house in the woods. I loved it there. Being from West Texas, it was always nice to resort to a place with trees. After a year or two of living in the house, my grandparents decided to renovate it to make it look like a log cabin. I had always felt something really unsettling about the house, and I warned them to be careful because renovating the house could stir up unpleased spirits. They went ahead with the renovations, gorgeous woodwork on the house with two beautiful decks looking out onto the mountains and an entire new living area in the basement. It was so pretty, and I was really excited to stay there in the summer. When I arrived though, the atmosphere was tense. It felt angry, even though my grandparents were very welcoming. It was quite strange. I got an official tour, and for the most part, the interior was the same. Then we went to the basement. I was overwhelmed with fear. I was hesitant to go down alone, and when I would, I could never stay for long. I always slept upstairs. I never felt safe down there. 
One day, I was making my way down the stairs to get some laundry, which was located across from the basement. I had only taken about three steps down when I suddenly felt cold and couldn't move. I just felt petrified. It wasn't too long before I felt a force on my back, and the next thing I knew, I was sliding down the stairs. I was still so petrified that I couldn't even scream. It was a silent fall. When I could move again, I rushed for my clothes and ran back up the stairs, and I didn't go back down for days. A week or so went by. It was July 3rd. It was storming all day, but still pretty warm outside. My grandparents had left for a party down the street, and I had decided to stay and hold down the fort, all alone. I was upstairs in their big open loft on their computer, just killing some time. It was still storming outside, and it was the last moments of daylight. I was listening to music with headphones over my head, browsing YouTube and the like. I felt a familiar cold breeze, but instead of my entire body, it was just my neck. And instead of it being extended like wind, it was brief. It was like somebody was right behind me and just blew on my neck. I wasn't moving. I was too scared to even breathe. I just stayed still, the headphones still on my head. All of a sudden, my headphones flew off with such force that they hit the computer screen in front of me. I screamed, ran, and panicked. I tried turning on the TV, but all it was was startling loud static. I tried turning it off, but it wouldn't. Trying to calm my nerves, I looked at a painting of a meadow that my grandparents had hanging by the TV, and I saw it. I saw a man with the most sinister evil face I've ever seen, with empty white eyes. I felt so much fear staring into them. Trust me, he'd never been there before. I ran outside in the rain, shoeless and terrified. I walked to the house where my grandparents were, and I never explained what happened. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there, and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. I was up near Antelope Lake, California, exploring this old mining town known as Lucky S with my girlfriend and her parents. There were a total of four of us. Lucky S is out in the middle of nowhere on this seemingly endless fire road. Then it just appears from the forest and you suddenly find yourself between at least four cabins, all in different stages of collapsing. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day, no later than 2 p.m., with clear skies. Knowing I was going into buildings that may or may not be haunted, I wanted to try to capture anything and everything that I could. So I brought my Nikon to take photos. We explored four or five cabins, ate some food, and then walked about a quarter mile farther up the road to the second half of this rundown town. While my girlfriend's dad was examining some old piece of large machinery and explaining how it used to work, I walked off alone to check out the next cabin. 
There were no steps leading up to this one, so the easiest way inside the structure was to either get a running start and jump in, or pull yourself up by grabbing onto either side of the doorway. I elected for the run and jump version and totally ripped my shorts down the leg. I'm in this rundown cabin and I take a shot of my girlfriend and her parents outside the other building. I turn and take shots of the holes in the roof of the cabin I'm in and then I hear an odd noise, like one of them is shuffling debris just outside the doorway that I jumped through. So I stop and stand still, listening. Then I hear an obviously loud knocking coming from the doorway. I quickly turned and I see all three of the people that I'm with still outside the structure across the way. No one was near me. So I turn back toward the other end of the cabin, the one that I'm in, and I just stare toward the doorway. Seconds later, there's more shuffling, followed by three obvious footsteps. The first one is the loudest, I think, because of how you have to enter the building. You can't just step in. So these three footsteps sounded like they walked right toward me and then stopped. I stood there for a few more seconds and then slowly walked toward the doorway. After that, I never heard anything again. It was my first and only experience like this. I wasn't alone. It was in the middle of the day. It was outside and it was very sunny and bright. So I guess that's the least scary way to experience this. In any case, I'll take it. Either way, there was nobody near me and nobody in the cabin with me that could have made that sound. So I don't know what happened but it definitely wasn't natural. I was up north at my uncle's cabin when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs and I'm staring outside at the windows, which are downstairs because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side, multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle, the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house though, but I still wonder if it might've been him. Our family has a small cabin up north that we go to when the summers get too hot. Our cabin has four rooms and a loft. There's a kitchen area, a living area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the loft. The rooms are tiny and our family is big, so we're always bunking up and sleeping on air mattresses all over the place. This particular weekend was 4th of July and the whole family came up to the cabin. Once everybody got settled in and had lunch, we all wanted to go for a walk in the woods. It was a beautiful day and we all started to venture out. My nephew, who was four at the time, started to get a bit fussy and tired. So I took him back to the cabin with me for a short nap. I set up the air mattress up in the loft and I put him down for a nap. It was almost 1 p.m. and I figured he could nap for 30 or 40 minutes and then be ready to go back out and play afterwards. My nephew then wanted me to lay down next to him, so I did, and we both started to fall asleep. 
I finally woke up by the motion of the air mattress moving. I figured my nephew had maybe rolled over to the other side or something. But now I was awake, and I could feel the sun on my face from the small window above. I glanced over to my nephew, and he was fast asleep, not facing me. I started to nod off again, but then I was woken up by the same motion of the air mattress moving. It's that sound, you know? The swooshing of the air. It felt like somebody had just sat down on the air mattress at my feet. So I look up and I see nothing. My nephew is still sleeping in the same spot. So then I just lay there, awake, and my eyes were still focused on the lower part of the air mattress, down by my feet, when all of a sudden, an area of the mattress started to depress, you know, like when someone had just sat down on it and made the indentation. I heard that same swooshing sound of a rush of air, and I screamed. My nephew woke up and I grabbed him, and we ran down the stairs and out the door. We waited outside until the rest of my family returned from their walk in the woods, and when I told the story, my sister-in-law told me that her mother had experienced paranormal stuff at the cabin for years. Thanks for letting us know. To this day, I still don't know and can't really explain what it was, but nothing like that has ever happened to me since. I don't know about the rest of the family, though. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 at Jellystone Park. It's the one right beside the nature trail. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until after we had gotten home. It turns out that my sister, who was eight, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. At first, we thought the figure was my dad and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see a man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, you don't belong here, or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C-82 is something that we reminisce about often. We've been curious if anyone else has experienced anything strange there. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Laurie, Virginia, and experienced anything paranormal, we would love to hear your story. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead. And while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. 
As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, Do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed, and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door, slowly, to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there, but everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods to the same spot and the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since, and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared, and I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it, but to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. 
We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations, once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back in the woods, and the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, nothing really happened except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had, and so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life this tall black figure in his room at night, and that it was a really serious thing because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself. But we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason, we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything. They were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before, and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. At my high school, all the seniors went on an annual camping and rafting trip up in Maine. My class only had about 90 kids in it. All the kids got assigned cabins, four to a cabin. The campground was beautiful. It was right on this huge lake at the bottom of a mountain. On the first night that we were there, some of the people who worked there sat around this huge bonfire with us and told us the story of a ghost who haunted the grounds. Apparently, the campground used to belong to a rich family back in the early 1900s, and the daughter of the owner drowned in the river or something like that while sneaking around after dark with her lover. They said that if you were in bed and you heard the sound of rushing water, like a river, 
She was outside, waiting to guide you to the river. If you saw her light, you would be entranced, and she would walk you to your watery death. The teachers told us that they only told the story to scare the kids from leaving their cabins after bedtime, and that it wasn't real. I got paired up with three other girls in my cabin, and we stayed up the first night giggling and talking. By the time we finally fell asleep around 3 a.m., I was jolted awake by a loud sound. It sounded like something large splashing in water. The lake was nowhere near the cabins, by the way. You had to walk like 15 minutes to get to the water, and the river was at least three or four miles away. I figured it was a dream or something, so I ignored it. But a few minutes later, it happened again. I looked over and saw that two of the other girls were wide awake, petrified. One of them looked out the small window, but nobody was there. We didn't sleep well that night. None of the other kids heard the noise, except for a group of boys whose cabin was very far from us. They said they heard it at around 1 a.m., right outside their cabin. And when they woke up, there was a bright light shining into their cabin. When they looked out, they could see a light flashing in the dark trees. We all confronted the campground people, but they all said they had nothing to do with it. The teachers did runs every now and then throughout the night to check and make sure the students weren't out of bed or doing things they shouldn't be doing. They said that they didn't see or hear anything. We didn't believe them. And one of the girls in my cabin was so scared that she wanted to go home. She called her mom and everything to come and get her. Keep in mind, this trip cost all of us a lot of money, and we had paid for three days. The teachers tried to calm her down, and the campground people insisted on staying up with us to see if it happened again. She stayed. The next night, the teachers stayed outside our cabin, while the campground people stayed outside the boys' cabin. All of the students were accounted for. One of the teachers continued to walk around and check all the cabins so nobody was out of bed. Nothing happened for a while, so eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up what seemed like minutes later to one of my cabin mates screaming and pointing at the door. I looked over and saw really long, dark, wet hair dangling in front of the window. The teachers came running in, and a few minutes later, so did the campground people. The other girl was sobbing and it woke everybody up. We told them what we saw, but the campground people said that nobody else was staying in the campground, and the teachers confirmed that everybody was accounted for and nobody had wet hair. Nobody slept that night, and for the last night, we all just camped out in the main hall because we were too afraid to sleep in the cabins. I had forgotten about this story until just now. I've always figured that either the teachers or workers there were playing a sick joke, but I guess I'll never know. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away. And that's it for miles. We had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, and so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. 
Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. I still have no idea what we saw. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring, fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field, and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement, just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around and what I see surprises, but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser, but they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately. And one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool. So we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, 
we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chatter up, 
flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually, we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from Eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we live. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population, as a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great grandfather who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the second world war. He fought in both world wars and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night, he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Blasky, the dying language that we used to speak here which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. 
He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, 
deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. My wife, sister, and I are all avid backpackers. We spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But back in 2018, we decided to do pull-up camping with stargazing in Colorado as the main goal. We're from the Midwest. We used a light pollution map to find a remote camping area in San Juan National Forest and planned to hike during the day and stargaze at night. The first day and night, the stars and trails were amazing, and we were all super stoked to be in the mountains and away from Flatland. It was the clearest I've ever seen the Milky Way galaxy, and it was phenomenal. After the first night, we all got up early and decided to do another hike, this time following a small dirt forest road through the mountains. We were all having a great time and there were nothing but positive vibes. I mentioned that our hike felt more like a walk since we were on a road, so we all agreed to take the first proper trail we came across. We had a GPS unit, a map, and a compass, so we weren't worried about getting lost. We finally came across a trail that ran perpendicular to the road and had a slight gradient running down the mountain. Staying true to our word, we all agreed to see where it went and turned onto the trail. As soon as we left the road and stepped onto the trail, I had an unprovoked and overwhelming feeling of doom come over me. Suddenly, my excitement left me and I felt almost instinctually that I would be in serious danger if I went down this trail. This unprovoked feeling of doom was strange enough, but when my sister said, guys, I don't think we should go down this trail, and my wife responded, oh good, you feel that too? I lost my shit. We quickly returned to the road and continued our walk. We all agreed that we had the same unprovoked sensation once we stepped onto the trail and could not come up with any logical explanation. I have never experienced anything like this, and it still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. 
This story happens in the Latin American country I was living in at the time. I was a 22 to 23 year old female finishing my master's degree in the local university. I had a part-time job as a receptionist in an institute and usually I had the afternoon shift. I left work every day at about 8.30 p.m. to go to the bus stop, then walk like five minutes to get home from there. Even though this is and was one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I lived in a relatively safe city in a good neighborhood. Still, I walked very alert of my surroundings and I was ready to run and call for someone if needed. This is where my story starts. For a few days, I had been seeing this very big, expensive white SUV with tinted windows driving around my neighborhood. I'd never seen it before, but I just thought it was a new neighbor. After a few days, I started noticing that the SUV seemed to follow me. It was always parked in a corner of my street and usually started driving when I walked past it. Obviously, this gave me the creeps, so I told my boyfriend and my parents. Since the driver never did anything, just drove, not even slowly at times, they said it could be a coincidence and it could be, in fact, a neighbor. What started as nighttime encounters that went on for several weeks, but not on a regular basis, turned into daytime encounters. This SUV started to follow me around the neighborhood, sometimes passing by me fast several times in a row, sometimes slow, almost at the same speed I was walking. I discreetly took note of the license plate and always kept it in my phone, as it was a popular year model SUV. I started to look for it everywhere I went, and I noticed that they followed me to other parts of the city. This really freaked me out, and I finally contacted the police. I didn't do it before because they're mostly useless. They, of course, told me that they couldn't do anything about it unless it was physical. Otherwise, they could assume that it was just a coincidence. I was in panic mode. I even dreamed about this situation. I alerted my parents, my boyfriend who was working in another city, friends and coworkers. I even told my boss and surprisingly, she let me go in and out of work at different schedules so as to try to avoid the driver. This seemed to work for the first week and I thought it was over. Silly me, it wasn't. One morning I was going to the bakery to buy some fresh bread for lunch and there was the SUV. They started to slowly follow me. I was very anxious. I still shake just thinking about it. The only thing I was thinking was that I needed to run, but I didn't want to alert them that I knew they were following me. For context, my street was very long and on one side there were only buildings. On the other side, there was a tall wall no houses, no people passing. My goal was to arrive to the little shopping center where the bakery was. But when I saw they were still following me, I knew that that wasn't a good option. They could get me on my way out. For the first time, it got confrontational. They rolled down one window and started to scream things at me. So I decided to go to my friend's office, which was on the second story of the shopping center. I quickly ran up the stairs and went into her office. I told her how they were following me and that this time I had an even worse feeling about it. She got scared also and told me to go hide in the bathroom and lock the door. A few minutes later, guess what? A chubby balding man in his 40s walked in and casually asks her about me. He said he was driving down the street when he saw his cousin entering her office. Since it had been a while since he had last seen her, me, he wanted to say hi, but she didn't hear him calling her, so he parked his car and went up to greet her. He insisted that he had seen this cousin walking inside the office, but my friend, bless her, insisted with a poker face that no one had ever entered her workplace since a few hours ago. She said later that she was shaking inside, but she wasn't gonna let them get the better of her. He asked if she was sure, and she kept telling the same story over and over and insisting that there was no one there and that she was all alone. She asked him to go. All the while, I was listening to this exchange from the bathroom. 
When he finally left, she closed her office and told me it was safe to go out. I cried. I was petrified with fear and terror, and so was she. We immediately called the police. This time they took me more seriously, and as I had the license plate number, they agreed to patrol the neighborhood on a regular basis. My friend called her boyfriend, who was a taxi driver from the company downstairs, and he took me home because my legs were shaking and I couldn't even move. From that day on, I always had someone driving me in and out of work or school, or I took taxis, something that I hadn't done before because they're expensive. I think the police presence in the area spooked him, or maybe the police found him and had a talk with him. I never knew. I never want to know either. I shiver thinking about what his intentions with me were, but the fear comes back every time I think about him. My parents still live in the area, as does my friend, but I eventually moved out of the city. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy the story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's gonna get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name, but I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. 
It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the clusters smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. This happened a couple of years ago when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. 
On one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor. She lives in the same area I do, and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool, I think. As you do for a Nerf War, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf War ended and we had a great time as usual, and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in, and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly, and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us, but then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day, so I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired, and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away, so when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back, and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets, hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water, my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg, and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stocks attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them, so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on, and sighed happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. help breaking this down and I need to feel like I'm not crazy. I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work both in the office and in court and I split my time about half and half. On a Friday in April, I was in the office at my desk. I sometimes also assist customers who come into our office who have questions on certain types of filings. I'm the backup coverage specifically for our records window. In my state, we are considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case, unless it's juvenile, confidential, or sealed by the court. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. on this Friday, so our records clerk could leave a little bit early. No problem. I have no issues helping out when I can. Around 4.15, we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them. This man comes in frequently to get copies of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up because it is a bit important. We are set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens up to a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead, and the DA's office is to the left, and the clerk of courts, or COC, where I work, is to the right. You have to open a separate set of doors into our little lobby. There's a counter with windows, and it's an L shape. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. 
There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man, we'll call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family's case or whatever he's doing. I don't really know and it's none of my business, but I assume that's what he's doing. He came up to my window somewhere around 4.15 to 4.20 and said that he requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminals, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue, glanced at the document and asked, did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. I wrote him a little slip out with a number of copies and his total owed. I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to the windows four through five for cashiers for payment and that I would meet him there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed. I messed with that for a minute, counted the pages and took them to the cashier. Then I went back to my counter to help the next person in line. The next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer, it was after 425. My coworker Lynn asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's closet after work. And my answer was, hell yeah, let's go. Right as we're discussing this, I'm in view of the records window, but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to the counter. I went up to the counter and I asked how I could help him. He stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost 10. I replied, no, I'm not. How can I help? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift from my niece, a painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. No, sir. I printed off what was in the queue. So you don't need these four pages? I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip, seven pages total, and I sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30, it's Friday, and we're closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes and then went inside. I beat Lynn there, so I started browsing. She came in a couple of minutes later, stating that she got caught behind a train. So we start shopping and chatting. For some reason, I looked at the door when it opened. There was Joe. Now I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got Lynn's attention. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? So I pulled Lynn into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short. I'm tall and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store and he looked like he was rubbernecking it the whole time. So he goes to the back of the store, grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them and continues looking around. I continued to watch him and as he moved, we moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind the clothing racks. He moved around the perimeter of the store continuing to just gawk around, looking for something or someone. He finally leaves and we freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and just chalk it up to coincidence. And then I realized that we were talking about it literally in front of him. And Lynn, she's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened, just in case it was something to worry about, and we ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt so uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what happened and told her that I thought about calling the police, the non-emergency number. I did, and I left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and I explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name, at this point, I recognized him but didn't know his name offhand, and he told me that he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday and left a voicemail. Monday was fine. Tuesday, I was out of the office. But Wednesday? Joe came back on Wednesday. 
He came in at 4.20 to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. For reference, it should have been like a minute. Two, because he needed something notarized. He left and I just had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said that if he comes back Thursday to call and they would come down to talk to him. The police department is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around, no Joe, until 425. He beelined it for the computer in the corner. I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies who work security were notified. Three deputies followed him into my office. I called the PD. Two officers came down and they questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's closet. He said he was shopping for his two young daughters, nine and 11. Problem is they don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, once upon a child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So he had a receipt in his car for once upon a child for 5.07 PM. He denied hearing my conversation with Lynn regarding going to Plato's after work. He stated he left my office at 4.15 and took his children shopping for clothes. He did not have his children with him at the courthouse or at Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, did she call you? He also stated that he believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office and he has arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's really nothing the officers can do. They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is he could opt into his case electronically, but he made this big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he was having issues, he could call the court support line and they would be able to fix the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay $1.25 a page instead of a one-time $20 fee. Apparently, he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year, his roommate filed a restraining order against him, followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging sexual harassment. I won't go into details regarding the family's case, but let's just say it's more than messy. He's also filing extremely high level types of documents for being somebody representing himself. Today, I was in court all day, came down to my desk at around 4.05 p.m. and he came in at about 4.10 p.m. I left while he was still at my office. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. The officers can't do anything else. I need another incident outside of my office to file a restraining order I have ordered home security, I signed up for self-defense classes, and I'm purchasing mace. I don't know what else to do. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed he was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names. 
and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day, I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable, I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet. 
for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just wanna live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. 
I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it, and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, 
nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing like 14 year olds do when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot, the ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us. And that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridal path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. 
But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in the search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're gonna find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer 
for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs>